Hello and welcome to Evaluation Toolkit Part 1. On behalf of the Native Connections team and contracting officer representative Maureen Madison and Jan Denbar Cooper, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, BC, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Valerie Pinkayek. I'm a grantee technical assistant for Native Connections. Waka. Triana Ila Zahluda Aknachbak. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Thank you for your heart and for the work that you're doing for your community. Thank you for having the strength to be able to meet your communities where they're at with the patience and wisdom to gently guide them to better tomorrow. We do this knowing that our ancestors have been doing this for generations through whatever hardship they face, and we know they face many. We, like our ancestors, continue to keep our eyes on the hills for better things to come. Our ancestors faced many uncertainties just as we do today. And most importantly, they learned from them and adapted. We continue to learn from each challenge and apply that knowledge even now for the generations who will arise after us. Your work is important. You are pillars in your communities. And today, I will sing. I will sing to remind you that each of you brings strength. And that strength is amplified in unity. For we never face challenges alone, and there are always lessons to be learned. Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Deborah Radler. I am Grobant from North Central Montana. I live in Spokane, Washington, and I'm one of the grantee technical assistants with Native Connections. And good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're calling from. Uh, my name is Hunter Genia, and I come from the Ojibwe and Odawa nations in the central lower part of Michigan, wishing you all a, a prayerful day. And I am also one of the grantee technical assistants for over 10 Native Connection grantees. Deborah? Thank you. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everybody. And this is the first in a series of four webinars about evaluation. By the end of the series, we think you'll have a greater understanding of how to tell your story through assessment and evaluation. Our focus today is on the new Evaluation tool Toolkit, Unit 1. Now, this toolkit is based on the American Indian Higher Education Consortium, or AHEX, evaluation framework. We're also going to review how the Native Connections approach has provided a way to look at the importance of continual assessments and adjustments with your community starting from the beginning of the project. We're moving the evaluation and assessment process forward with this evaluation toolkit and these four webinars and providing you with tools to discover, shape, and then tell your story from an indigenous framework. Now, this toolkit is not meant to tell you what your story should be or how you should tell it. That's going to be up to you. But before we move forward, we want to ask you a question that you, and you can put your answer in the chat box. Um, this, is, this information will help your GTA to kind of get a better understanding of how you are approaching data collection and evaluation. Mark, can you pull up the first question? There we go. So consider the data that you have collected so far. Is it qualitative or quantitative data? Okay, wow, 
this, this is really interesting. It looks like we're starting out with quantitative data with a number of you. Moving into qualitative. I think as we move through this webinar, you'll have a, um, and through the, these four webinars, you're going to have a better understanding of just how to um, use both of these data sources. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating in this poll. I think this is giving us a really good indication that a lot of, a lot of the programs are focusing on quantitative data. And again, we are going to be reviewing how to, in, how to um, pull in the qualitative data also. Thank you. Now here's a graphic that I know you're all familiar with, the Native Connections approach. You've seen this since the beginning of your first year, and we've featured this in many of our webinars. But for the evaluation toolkit in our webinar series, we are focusing on the blue section in the upper right quadrant. And now this is where the information about indigenous evaluation is located. You know, American Indian and Alaska Native populations have always used evaluation. We've always had ways of assessing if things are useful, if they have worth, or if they're not working. We've adapted to harsh environments, forced relocation, and faced everything from changing environment to genocide. Along the way, we've used our evaluation knowledge and skills to continually assess our situations. As groups, we made decisions on what are the next steps. We discussed lessons learned and made changes to make life better for our children and to help our people adapt, survive, and become stronger. This cycle of assessment, discussion, and making change is evaluation and has led to survival and resilience. The evaluation process and Native Connections is important for the same reasons. It helps you do what you intend to do and it helps you know if your efforts are successful or need to change along the way. Now, as previously noted, this toolkit aligns with the American Indian Higher Education Consortium's evaluation framework. Now, this framework will guide us to weave our cultural values into the evaluation process. As you move through our webinars, you're going to see how the framework connects with the Native Connections approach. So if you look at the inner circle of the graphic, it shows the four elements of Indigenous evaluation practice. Each unit of the evaluation toolkit and subsequent webinars will explore each element more in depth. The center of the circle's first element, engaging community and building capacity, is the focus of today's webinar and also Unit 1 of the toolkit. Unit 2, 3, and 4 will look at how to create the story, build the scaffolding, and plan, implement, and celebrate. Now, AHEC suggests these elements be embedded in core cultural values. Your place, gifts, community, and sovereignty, and centered in traditional ways of knowing. Now, this is our indigenous knowledge, our keen observations, multiple perspectives, community, and individual experience. Now, while these values and way of knowing are suggested, now they can be changed to better fit your local values through community agreements. This toolkit will also include instructions, descriptions, and strategies for including this information in your program evaluation plan. Next, we're going to discuss how the Native Connections process and the AHEC framework are connected. Now you can see the Native Connections approach side by side with the AHEC evaluation framework. You know, you're going to notice immediately that both of them are circular. And this indicates the program follows the way of life from beginning to end. Once begun, the cycles repeat through periods of a continual assessment and adjustments involving community members. 
Now, evaluation and native connections began with a new story of your community, which helped you create a vision of success, and it provided tools to reach your intended vision. It also helped you know if your efforts are or will be successful and where change is needed. Through the Native Connections Project, you begin to engage your community. You began to build capacity in a step-by-step -step process that included the community systems analysis and conducting the community readiness model assessments. You developed data plans to measure success, and through discussion and analysis, you move this information forward in your engagement processes, which will continue throughout your programs and hopefully beyond. The AHEC evaluation framework continues this process, but it moves into a way to honor traditional values, knowledge, and practice which are central to respect for community and tribal sovereignty. The AHEC framework stresses the importance of involving the community in a participatory evaluation approach where stakeholders are actively engaged. Participation occurs in all phases of the evaluation from identifying relevant questions, developing the evaluation plan. And so your evaluation plan uh, will help you gather and analyze data and reporting the results to the stakeholders. Uh, putting both the Native Connections approach and the AHAC Indigenous framework together bring us to where we are today. And so it helps us to move a step closer to achieving your vision. The toolkit uh, is going to provide you more in-depth information on the AHAC framework and will list important things to consider when designing and evaluating. Telling the program's story. The first step in the evaluation process is to reflect on what the program plans to do. Now you did this when you developed your SAP vision statement and the outcomes that you expect at the end of your five-year grant. The strategic action plan you developed included a section on the data you are collecting. So your data describes how close or how far you are from your vision outcomes. Your data will also, also will tell us if we are there yet and if we have achieved our goals. So data can come in two ways. Qualitative data tells the quality of your story and your documents and what happened. Quantitative data describes the impact of your story through numbers. How many youth did you serve? Partnerships were created? MOUs established or developed? So both qualitative and quantitative helps to tell your story. The strategic action plan is a story of how you plan to make a difference in suicide prevention, substance misuse, and mental health promotion. And your activities are the stories about the work you are doing to make change happen. So your data supports the story. Reporting your data tells the story. So as we progress through each of the four units of the toolkit, you'll see how the Native Connections approach and the Indigenous Evaluation Framework are interwoven. The circular framework will help you weave your story through the evaluation process and help you integrate evaluation throughout. And I just want to check in with my colleague and see if Deborah is back on. I'm back in. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you for taking over for me there. I want to back up um, to this slide and just give you another perspective on what Hunter was talking to us about, about the program story. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the picture that you see here. You know, you can see that an activity is happening. An elder is telling a story. And you can see that there's three people listening. And it looks like there's two youth there. 
But perhaps what we can't see is that there's additional people also listening to the story. So everybody is listening to the story and they're giving this elder their undivided attention. You know, once the story is over, maybe the people will have learned a lesson that they're going to think about for a while and it's going to stick with them. If we're going to evaluate the storytelling event, there are two things that we could do. We could count the number of people present who you see and maybe who you don't see. This is going to be your quantitative data. Then we would find a way to document the quality of the story. What did he say? What did they hear? You know, what resonated with them? What did they take away from the story? That's going to be your qualitative data. So we can look at data in two ways through this picture. We can see that there's a qualitative and quantitative data that you can gather. Now just to give you a shortened um, perspective on this, you know your qualitative data is descriptive, descriptive and conceptual. It documents what happened, what did he say, what did we hear, what was the story about, what was the lesson learned. The quantitative data is what you can count. In this picture we see four people here, but maybe there's four more on the other side that we can't see. So you'd have eight people here. So how many youths do you see? In this picture we see two. How many adults do we see? We see two. So those are the people that are listening to the story. You know, in your Native Connections um, programs, many of you have created partnerships. How many of them did you do? How many were created? How many MOUs were established? So you can see that just from a simple picture like this, you can gather your qualitative data and quantitative data. So we have a question for you right now. And again, we've inserted questions throughout our slides to kind of help our GTAs get a better idea of how to help provide TA to you. So what are some of the ways that you are reporting your evaluation? Oh, no, no. We have consider the data you have collected so far. Is it qualitative or quantitative data? Well, I think we're going to have two up here. Let's see. Okay. Some of the ways yeah, that you are the... reporting. Okay, strategic next one. Okay. Yeah, what are some of the ways you're reporting your data? So it looks like right now we have a number of people that are reporting in a written format. Um, some people are doing this in pictures. If you have, if you um, have other up there, you can use the chat box. And so it looks like Lisa has said through anecdotal information through focus groups. Hillary said graphic displays. Social media metrics like Facebook. Excellent. Yes. So you can see there are a number of different ways that you can report how you're telling your story. Now Hunter talked a little bit about this one here, about the strategic action plan story. And again, you know, I really wanted to emphasize that as we move through each of the four units of the toolkit, you're going to see how the Native Connection approach and the Indigenous Evaluation Framework are interwoven. Again, both of those are circular. I really like these comments that are coming up. Um, Dorothy said that they use both written and pictures and graphs and tables. Yes, I've seen some of those reports and those are really interesting. Kit Van Stel from Lac de Flambeau, we use all of these. In addition, we use community indicator, surveillance data, Facebook analytics, event surveys, and lots of community input. Also CRM workshops. Wow, that's great. Um, Chrissy said we would love to know more about social media metrics and I think you'll probably find some more information on that and some of the upcoming on the other units of the toolkit. And Lisa said written photos and social media metrics. Okay. So I think now I'm going to turn this over to Hunter 
and he's going to talk about engaging communities. All right. Thank you, Deborah. Man, you did awesome. You got to evaluate uh, that snowstorm, what happened there. Um, <laughs> I have a, a real special announcement, though. And uh, for all of you who participate in our polls are going to be eligible to win a bag of wild rice that I have that I will mail to you. Um, but in order to be eligible, you have to participate in our polls or chat box. And we'll pick a winner by the end of the week uh, when we get some of the data back. And we'll evaluate who won. All right. So thank you, Deborah. That was an awesome job. Um, so this is about engaging community. And I, uh, these words, we are borrowing the future from the next seven generations. And so the, your Native Connections grant is focused on suicide prevention, mental health promotion, and substance misuse. It also relies heavily on an indigenous approach in that we are ensuring that the community is engaged through the, throughout the full spectrum of the grant implementation. And so we see how engaging community, this section is tied and connected and woven throughout evaluation because we are evaluating our community members and citizens uh, participation, as Deborah had mentioned. And we do this through the CSA, through the CRM, through our community advisory boards. Um, and so this Native Connections grant uh, really does an awesome job in ensuring and recommending and making it required that our community's voice is throughout the process. So we call this uh, community engagement uh, empowerment evaluation, which we'll discuss more in detail in Unit 3. Empowerment and evaluation depends on community engagement, and this philosophy inherently aligns well with our Indigenous way of living and balance. It honors an Indigenous approach to healing, wellness, and decision making. So let's take a look at some of the core principles and values of communication. But before we do that, we are going to bring out another question for you about engaging community. And what we would like to know is what is one effective community engagement activity that you have implemented? And if you could share that with us at this time. So what's your go-to one effective community engagement activity that you have implemented in your project? Photo contest, awesome. Children's Mental Health Awareness Day event. All right, keep them coming. I know multiple people are typing a youth summit, annual youth GONA, Red Ribbon Week, shirt making, awesome, youth theater performance and youth beach day, talking circles. Holy, that wild race must have woke you guys up. Here we go, suicide prevention, walk and week, youth and elders camp. Native Youth Leadership Academy, NILA, awesome. Utilizing annual health fair activities, uh, CRM interviews, help engage local leaders, pride events, the youth cultural camp, youth talking circles, that's awesome, thank you so much. Yeah, and I see one of the things that's really kind of woven throughout here is the use of our culture and you know, the 10 Native Connections grantees that I work with, uh, you know, and as well as when I talk to a lot of my GTA colleagues, we are all bragging about our own grantees and how much of an awesome job they're doing. So we really appreciate that, and thank you for sharing. You can continue to share because this information uh, will be collected, 
and this webinar is recorded, so we'll make sure those who couldn't make it will get a copy of it. So indigenous approach accounts for culture, traditions, and ceremony from the beginning. And, you know, when we talk about indigenous approach, the first aspect that we'll look at speaks to control. Now, that's not one of my particular favorite words, so I might use the term from an indigenous point of view, sovereignty, as it really is about the timing and direction of launching evaluation in the community and the community owning the process. And by doing this, therefore, we are acknowledging that the community are the experts. But first, I'd like to take a, look, a moment and look at some suggestions prior to approaching evaluation, data collection, or research in a tribal community. It is advisable that the evaluation team really understand the relationship, experience, and history between tribal communities and evaluation and research efforts. Because this hasn't always been positive or without struggle. It is also strongly recommended that specific cultural and tribal history training by the tribe be made available prior to any evaluation and research conducted. You know, especially if you're contracting uh, outside of the tribe to evaluate and do the research. And part of the historical struggle is that someone else is telling our story. So by the tribe applying sovereignty, therefore control, we ensure that the tribe's policies around research and evaluation are here, adhere to. You know, I used to have an uncle who taught me this uh, a long time ago. And he said, Hunter, he said, don't bankrupt your own people. And I thought about that. What did he mean by that? And what he meant by that is that we have our own indigenous experts and they're right here in our community. And we need to acknowledge that, we need to recognize that, and we need to activate that. And I thought, you know what, that teaching has lived with me uh, ever since he taught me that. And I try to follow it uh, as best I can. And we're very lucky and fortunate that we do have tribes that are uh, working with project evaluators uh, that have been taught very well and are respecting these teachings. So also when we talk about control or apply, uh, applying sovereignty, it also speaks to the idea that although the researcher is the expert in Western evaluation, and has influence in the timing and direction of the research, the community is the overall expert of their tribal community history, laws, welfare, governance, and traditions. It acknowledges that the community is involved in all aspects of evaluation, who will collect what data, and how the data will be analyzed and how it will be written and reported. So we're going to bring up another question here for you. And this speaks to uh, how, how or in what ways does your evaluation effort consider evaluation from a cultural perspective or world view? So if you can type in to the uh, box here, we're uh, just to the right of the photo there. You'll see at the top there, do your evaluation. Can you share with us uh, just one example, just one example of how your grantee project considers evaluation from a cultural or traditional worldview or lens? And go ahead and type away, and we'll read off some of these. I know somebody wants that wild rice.
Oh, I forgot to mention, and I'm sorry, my colleagues, GTAs, tribal tech staff, you're not eligible for the wild rice. Sorry about that. Awesome. Jason, every program has a cultural connectivity scale. Very nice. I see a lot of people are typing, so we're going to give you a few more seconds to let those populate. Ingrid Stevens, incorporate native values like connectedness and humor. Nice. Yes, in our indigenous ways, we always say that humor is good medicine. As long as it's not at someone's expense, eh? So. And we've got a few more people that are typing in here. Kit says, every aspect, culture is woven into the way we plan events, the way we advertise them, the way we design surveys, the way we analyze and interpret results and try to integrate calmness and patience. Thank you, Kit. And Michael Lynn, we used fishing gloves as an incentive to survey our fishermen. Awesome. Oh, I like it. All my relatives around the Great Lakes, you got to pick up on that one now. You know, we got a lot of fishermen in the house today. Jody, the talking data gathering and storytelling versus written surveys. Oh, I like that. Yes. Storytelling. Talking circles. Hillary says we invite elders to comment on efforts. Yes, and that's, you know, one of the things that we talked about is, is understanding our culture and, and our values. We understand that our elders um, you know, they're the wisdom keepers, they're, they're the wise ones, and they help guide us and teach us, and so they should be involved from beginning to end, most certainly. And incorporating visual ways of learning more than linear and collective worldview, more than individualistic worldview. Invite elders, relatives, Gona, and Goans, one of them recognize our relatives from Alaska. Using our elders to teach our youth. Yes, the intergenerational approach. Awesome. Being very considerate of the awareness and readiness level of the community. Intergenerational historical trauma is prevalent. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know, and, and I just want to mention this, and you know, we've all are living and have lived and are still living through trauma and historical trauma, intergenerational trauma, and the results of that. Um, and I just really encourage that our communities, uh, you know, acknowledge that, come together so that we can address that trauma in a good trauma-informed way, and then we can identify solutions and strengths and transcend that trauma. So awesome. You guys keep typing in there, man. You guys are rocking. That's, I, I love it. You guys are filling up my spirit cup. Oh, my goodness. Pamela Thurman had to jump in there. We are graced by her presence today, Pamela. Thank you. I think I've seen Bar Plus said she's in the house. Awesome. Trauma-informed and resiliency-based practices. Gona-style meetings. Yes, yes. You can take any meaning and make it a Gona style, and, and uh, that really engages a lot of our, of our people. Um, it's a little bit different, so if you've never done a Gona, check one out. Bring it to your community, and we can help you with that, too. All right. Thank you for all the responses. We really, really appreciate it, and our grantee, your peer grantees, really appreciate it, too. 
So another key aspect of the evaluation is the selection of participants. Now, many of you, if not all of you, have done community readiness uh, models that implemented that in your community in order to collect information and understand what the readiness level of your community is to take action and make sure that they align with the activities align with the readiness scores. And in our culture and way of living, our communities are woven together and often interdependent. You know, so if you're sitting down with the youth and you're recruiting their youth, you might be recruiting grandma too, right? Because that's a part of that young person's uh, life and has value and meaning. So we have to understand that and we have to recognize that. We have to respect that. So in that part of evaluation, in that sense, does consider tribal protocol, etiquette, and traditions as they pertain to how to ask for assistance that is sensitive and respectful to cultural norms. Now here where I live in the Great Lakes, our Anishinaabe people, I know if I was coming into someone else's community and wanting to do a project there or work, I'm going to make sure I have lots of tobacco, right? I'm going to bring that same on. And if I'm asking something, I have to give something back, and that's one of our fundamental teachings. So understanding this could ensure that evaluation efforts are trauma-informed and are more acceptable to the community. Some ways some ways tribal partners can advise and often assist is in the selection of participants. For instance, the CRM, key informant interviews, and how and to whom the information will be reported. They can also help in choosing the evaluation questions that will be asked to show the progress of the project. So using cultural etiquette when reporting to the stakeholders has been found to be useful. So some of you may decide that uh, when you're reporting out the information to your community or to your leaders, you might bring a gift, you might have a feast, you might have a giveaway. Those are just some examples, but they also utilize our culture. So one of the key decisions then is to discuss and decide and how involved the tribal community stakeholders will be in evaluation, research, and data collection. And this should be determined by the tribal community, right? Don't, bank our, don't bankrupt our own people. We want to make sure that they're involved and they are key, key stakeholders. They are the key stakeholder, in my opinion. So this ensures, this approach ensures that trust, respect, and sensitivity to cultural protocol and etiquette will be intact from beginning to end. This also reinforces the cultural strengths and resilience of the community. Therefore, we are reversing some of the harms of historical and generational trauma experienced because we're beginning to establish trust again. So I can't express enough the importance in understanding the tribal history, protocols, etiquette, local, state, and federal political concerns, right? Because, you know, in Indian country, we still have tribes uh, that have a struggle with some of the federal policies that are impacting tribes. So we also need to be aware of that. And this means that the expectation that the evaluator and research do their due diligence on the front end to ensure a respectful orientation and administration of research and evaluation. Your best educators are your community, your tribal community. And we also have to make sure that we don't fall into the trap thinking that all tribal communities are the same. They are different from one tribal community to the next. So if an evaluator has an experience in another tribal context, this doesn't guarantee that their experience applies to the next tribal community. Thank you so much for listening. Deborah?
And you can see here some of the pictures here meet the community where they are. And this, okay. it would not be um, it would not be necessarily inappropriate to attend a youth <laughs> gathering as long as you approach it the right way with some of the information I just shared uh, in that approach. Uh, your community is your best knowledge, and they will tell you the best way to move forward. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Hunter. So you know, building community support should be a key consideration of your story. You know, building community capacity began with your community readiness assessment, which helped you determine your community's readiness to address suicide and substance misuse. Community support is a key element of your evaluation story. It's seen in the partnerships that are formed, the youth that are served, and the people and programs that have been brought together. So building your community support and expanding capacity is important to talk about throughout the life of your program. And I think in the poll questions um, that Hunter brought up well, through his slides, you really gave a lot of good examples about how you're engaging your community and how you're really building that community support. Now we have some, a few questions here we wanted to ask you. You know, what are some ways that you've engaged your community? And some, what are some of the keys to your successful community collaboration? So take a moment to put a few things in the chat box here. Because I see we've already really, I think a lot of you have already put a lot of really good information about the ways you've engaged your community. But, um, you know, think about how you've used community support to build your programs or to build community capacity for your youth. So either question will give us some ideas of what you are doing. I'll give you a moment there to type. I see we have a, we have quite a few people typing there. So focus groups to design a resiliency game for youth. Thank you, Ingrid. Attending other community events. Yes, really looking at how you're increasing that community capacity. And Kit at Lac du Flambeau, our community readiness was really low. It has been effective for us to use tribal police dispatch data on suicide threats attempts to show the community the need for our program and the extent of our problem. It's really good, good information. Social input survey. And Pamela, readiness interviews engage the community and help somewhat strategic plan in its annual modification. We also have an advisory board comprised of some community members. These are all great ways to engage your community and really engage, get that um, successful community collaboration going. Hillary, ensuring that people filling a variety of roles in the community are invited to participate in planning. And Scott, project updates. Oh, wait, no. Went too fast. Boy, these are all some really excellent suggestions here. Let's see, Scott Barton, project updates to tribal memberships during membership meetings, various events and collaborations with outside vendors and partners. Community Facebook pages. Crystal, Crystal Lynn, when the community knows they can give honest feedback and that will not be connected to them so that we can tailor our activities and awareness campaigns and camps to their needs. We are also able to address some of the concerns in terms of addressing barriers and interests and specific cultural activities. We post questions when we do presentations and collaborate them to create a pivotal table to get the top three interest concerns. Excellent idea. Wait. Wow, what a way to go. Educating our communities on mental health issues and providing mental health training for both youth and adults. Yes, I think a number of our Native Connections grantees are doing exactly that. 
Lisa said, from our community assessment, we designed a responsive program that fills a gap for a mental health need in our community. We also consider where we are of value and avoid service duplication in our community. We have a youth council and elders council for our urban community as well. Well, what excellent ways to really build that collaboration and community engagement. Most, Stephanie said, most recently, we, we've received a lot of positive feedback and support to our new youth council. We partnered with tribal council, culture, after school TANF, education tutoring programs to make these meetings happen in three of our tribal communities. Uh, hey, Deb, I see one the, from, uh, okay. from Brenna. And okay. uh, I just kind of wanted to mention her because they're from uh, Minneapolis uh, metropolitan area. Okay. And they're working with youth program leaders and citywide youth events to collaborate. So I think that's pretty awesome for all you urbans out there. Mm -hmm. Brenna's a good one to connect with. Thank you. Let's see. Amy up in Alaska said offering quarterly, monthly youth health and wellness spotlights sent out to our communities and established a regional youth advisory council. Well, thank you all for your input on that. Those are all some excellent ways, you know, you know, to see what you're doing in your communities and how you've really successfully engaged people. Okay. I want to kind of turn to something else that we've really emphasized in Unit 1. Um, we did send out the first unit for this evaluation toolkit about a week ago. If you have not received it yet, please notify your GTA and they will get that out to you so that um, all these different moving pieces in this webinar today are all in that toolkit. You know, in Unit 1, there's a suggestion that discusses the importance of including youth and other community members. And as we can see from this last question here, how you are all really, you know, really making efforts to engage your youth and community members. You know, but the one thing about that I think those GTAs here is how to keep your community members and your youth groups engaged. How do you keep them going, especially your youth, you know, because as they um, move through the school system, middle school to high school to college, you know, they, you can run into some ways that you might need guidance or training. And when you're working with them on evaluation, it's reasonable to expect that they could need that kind of guidance. Now your community advisory board, boards, and I'm going to use that word, CAB, throughout this webinar, and you're going to see that in our toolkit. There are so many different ways that, that all of you grantees describe your community groups. And as, as we've seen that through community boards, youth councils, tribal councils, groups, um, but we're just going to come down to community advisory boards for the sake of these webinars. So think about how does your community advisory board, you know, really impact your evaluation plan? How are you including them when you're developing that plan or when you're implementing it or looking to make changes? Did they help guide the creation of your strategic action plan? And I think at the first, in the first year of your grant, that was one of the things that the GTA spent a lot of time on was, help, was really encouraging you to get youth involved in creating those strategic action plan activities. So we all know if your youth have a hand in helping develop them or just tell you what they want, they're more apt to, you're more apt to be much more successful. So have you been able to add people and youth throughout the life of your program? What are some activities that you use to keep your CAB members involved and engaged. Now, we have also have some fact sheets available for you with further guidance on community coalition buildings, building, and then again, your GTAs will be providing those to you. Now, with, throughout this youth book, throughout this toolkit, we have been preparing tools for you. And so with Unit 1, we provided two really good tools for you that will provide guidance on training community members in evaluation. And again, these are available for downloads today. And what these are are two short evaluation slide decks that you can use to train your community advisory boards. 
Both slide decks are available within the Unit 1 toolkit, and again, they are here for downloads today. And these are provided as a guide for you to use depending on your need to build capacity with your group. So feel free to modify the slides as necessary. Now the first slide deck is focused on types of evaluation that are compatible with the Native Connection approach and the Indigenous evaluation process. You're going to see information in there on impact evaluation, process, implementation evaluation, and outcome effectiveness evaluation. So this training also contains information about how to use the data you are gathering to improve your program. We've also included sample questions for outcome evaluation. And again, once you go through these slides, they are for you to use and for you to modify as you see as, as they are necessary for you. Now the second set of training slides is focused on developing evaluation questions. Now this training will help your CAB, including youth, understanding, understand the importance of developing questions to further focus your evaluation. These questions should reflect the purpose of the evaluation as well as the priorities and needs of the stakeholders. And the, the answers to the evaluation questions, those are going to be used to develop and improve your program. So again, these are for you to use as you see fit. We had a few more questions for you. Um, what are some activities that you have used to keep your community advisory boards or youth groups involved and engaged? So you can answer either one of these, or what have you done to create an environment of collaboration? And again, please use the chat box to answer the questions. I think so far we've seen so many good good information um, through all these um, different questions. Pam says we provide them updates, give them small gifts, and definitely feed them a good lunch. Jason said meals and is that meals and ceremony. Oh, yes, they're so important. Alicia said, we conduct quarterly meetings with our advisory board and always bring food to our upcoming meetings. And that just points out just how much, how important food is, you know, with all of our community advisory boards. Our advisory board meets monthly and are working to come up with community activities, ways to get the messages out, and plan our annual conference. Okay. Cassie said, I came in the middle of the project and there was no cab developed. Luckily, a couple of committee members reached out to me to support the work, and we began development from there. Yeah, that all it takes is you know one, one or two interested people to get your get your group started. Provide traditional foods. Okay. Boy, these are some really good suggestions on how to keep everybody involved in your programs. Hey, Deborah, I think I need to start going to some of their meetings if they're going to provide all that good food. <laughs> I know. I think that they know these sound really good. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Jody said, two big things that have been well received is ending the meeting with each person sharing something positive about another present and also continue reiterating to members that we are deciding to how to best spend the grant funds and need their input on how we want to do this. Then members get involved within what they are interested. That's an excellent way to do that because, again, if the youth or people have a say in your activities, you know that they're going to be successful. Stephanie said, we have a task force and meet monthly. It really helps maintain their involvement and participation. And then Amy, monthly telephone, teleconference calls, annual face-to-face, -face, and starting incentives for meeting participation. They also are invited to provide feedback on the other organizational projects that need the youth voice and value their perspectives. 
Lula said inviting the CAB to participate in our outreach and prevention activities and recognizing them to our communities. Boy, these are all some excellent ways to really keep your CABs involved and engaged. Thank you all for your questions, for your answers. Let's see, so what are some of the benefits of capacity building? I think in all of these um, answers that we've been, you know, reading, that I've been reading here that you've all helped um, to bring forward, like Brianna says, opening with icebreaker questions like favorite childhood memories. This helps the group get to know each other more than just professionally. I think this helps everyone care about the people in their group. I think you can see how the benefits of having a good meal, good activities, humor, regular meetings, this all benefits building capacity in your communities. I think from all of these answers that we have up here, this really shows that your CAB members will know and have a better understanding of your program. They're gonna get involved with your program. And again, building program improvements and partnerships are really evident in all of these answers that we've seen. The voice in your community and the voice of the youth are heard and they're actively you know, included. And again, you know, Amy, you said monthly teleconference calls. Amy's um, with the Alaska and Pribilof up in, and so I know that I'm her GTA, so I know that her, she has a lot of villages that they work through. And so those teleconference calls are really important. And it's one way that I know that they successfully use to really include the voices of their youth. You know, and through all these answers, you see experience. You see wisdom in here. You see community standards of excellence that you're all acknowledging throughout your answers here. You know, yeah. when you put this back into an evaluation perspective, this all is used to strengthen your programs and in turn it's strengthening your communities. So all the lessons that are learned from all of these answers that you've helped us with today, these are all spread throughout everything that you do through your media plans, your community activities, this all is going to create stronger links to bring in a wider net of people and other programs. And again, building your capacity. Now, we also cover the IRB, Institutional Review Board, briefly in this Unit 1. Now, the Institutional Review Board is really an abstract term. And I think before I really talk a little bit more about this slide, I want to know about what do you know about IRBs? So name one, two, or three things that you know about an IRB. And let us know if you've used an IRB, an Institutional Review Board. And again, unit one of the toolkit does address IRB. And in a minute, I'll provide a brief overview of that section. Let's see, Cassie said IRBs make sure research is performed ethically. Yes. Tamara Perkins, yes, we use the IRB to make sure we are doing things in a good way. Okay. Mary said our tribal policy requires OR, ORB, not sure what that, let's see. Not sure what that is, Mary. Um, Ingrid, lengthy and takes time when it has to go through tribal review, but well worth it. Yes, it is well worth it. Jody said, I only know then in context of human research to ensure ethics and safety are adhered to, yes. Jason said it's supposed to keep people from getting hurt. That is really true. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, Mary, <laughs> IRB, sorry, <laughs> typo there. Uh, Pamela Thurman, Choc let's see, Chocta has a well-established IRB and we use it diligently. They protect the participants and the project. Thank you. Caroline, I am in a PhD program. I use them to make sure my study is ethical and follow all requirements to keep the safety of my participants. And Kit? An evaluation of NC isn't research. IRB oversight is not necessary for SAMHSA required evaluation of these programs. Um, thank you. I will, I'm going to get to that in a minute. Now, Hillary said the Alaska area 
IRB is very careful to ensure that data on tribal populations is not used in a manner that tribes would not approve of. And I think we really heard that in what Hunter said um, earlier in this webinar about how important it is to keep that tribal sovereignty and integrity within the tribe. Thank you for that. Crystal said the College of Muscogee Nation utilizes an IRB to ensure protection of participants. Well, I think you've all given some really great answers here to this IRB question. You know, and just briefly, you know, the IRB Institutional Review Board serves as an objective third party or an oversight committee, and it's governed by federal regulations with the purpose of protecting and managing risk to human participants involved in research. And again, your human subjects are, you know, they are the living people within your, your programs. And I think somebody up here said something about SAMHSA and Native, oh, KIT, an evaluation of NC is in research, IRB oversight is not necessary for SAMHSA required evaluation of these programs. And you're correct there in that most of the data collected by, Native Connect, by the Native Connections grant does not qualify as human research subjects, human subject research. You know, the community readiness, that is used in Native Connections is not considered human subject research because it is, it is asking for people's opinions and no identifying information is requested. But you know, if you're unsure about the data you collect, if you should, you know, if you're unsure about if you should utilize an IRB or not, we provided a user-friendly tool for you to determine if your data qualifies as human subject research. So if you look in Unit 1 on page 10 of the toolkit, you're going to see that we included a link in there for you to just answer a really quick two-question tool. And you're going to that will at least help you give you a determination if you need to do an IRB or not. So again, if you don't have the toolkit yet, please contact your GTA and they will get that to you immediately. So thank you, everybody, for answering these questions on the IRB. Now, engaging leadership, it's really important to include tribal and our community leadership from the beginning of the project. Many Native Connections grantees make regular reports to elected tribal and or traditional leadership throughout the life cycle of the grant. Depending on your grant partners, there might be a need to report regularly to them. And again, every program, Native Connections program, has their way of doing this. But what we want to emphasize here today is that it is really important to do regular reporting to keep your leadership and your stakeholders up to date on your progress. The toolkit does offer some suggestions for talking points that apply to effective reporting, including keep your report short and simple. Start with describing your mission. Really explain why does this matter. Capture the main points and present them early and succinctly. If you are asking for something, be clear about what you are asking them to do. And think about what matters most to your audience and what questions they may want answered and focus your talking points or report on those. And I think with all of your Native Connections grantees, you know, you, you really do come up with some good reports and I think you be, I've, I know with my grantees, I've seen these in the, I've seen some of the reports that you've done through your annual reports. Now, in summary, you know, we hope that you, you know, this has been a good introduction to the Evaluation Toolkit, Unit 1. Now, this is going to help you tell your story or to begin to tell your story through the evaluation process. We've discussed the importance of control, sovereignty, how important it is to keep that culture within your evaluation plan. Community and capacity building go hand in hand and are greatly enhanced when community members are engaged and empowered to take part in the evaluation process. Unit 2 will further explore how your evaluation story can be understood through a logic model process. We will look at the process and outcome evaluation and explore ways to use this information for program improvement. Now again, we have provided tools and resources which will be coming um, with each of the subsequent units as we go through them. 
And again, these are going to be provided so that you can continue the process of creating your story through the evaluation process. Um, BC, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Deborah. So if we have any questions right now, please feel free to enter them in the chat box. I know Hunter's been taking down all your names and we'll be following up later with the uh, prize of the rice. And I appreciate the great engagement that we've had on this call. So we'll hold just a moment for for some possible questions. Otherwise, I'm going to give you a little update on what's coming up. As Deborah noted, this is the first of four webinars on the Evaluation Toolkit. The next one will be on April 21st for Part 2 or Unit 2, followed by May 12th for Unit 3, and then May 26th for Unit 4. So it does look like we have a couple people typing here. We'll look forward to see what they have to say. Oh, well, thank you, Barb, for joining us. It's always good to talk to you and have you on the line. So, Hunter or Deb, any comments as we're waiting for folks to, I see folks are typing in here. Yes, Ingrid, it absolutely does feel good to be connected, and we appreciate all of you for joining us. We know we're going through a stressful time, and, you know, however we can help you, we, we are happy to be here, and we appreciate you joining us here today. So I, I do want to give a little plug for our podcast as well. I don't know if folks have gotten a chance to listen to them, but they are on the SoundCloud platform, and we've sent out e-blasts e about them. And um, we've had about, I believe, four at this point about working with tribal governments, about um, engaging youth, new youth, sustainability, and um, our latest one is Two-Spirit Youth, and that was really, really good. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Mark. And I've seen some comments go by, and I have to apologize. They went by so fast I didn't catch them. So uh, if, if anyone, Deborah or Hunter, if you saw mm -hmm. them, please let me know. I see people thanking us for, for joining us. Uh, Great. Well, we do appreciate your thanks. We really do, and we thank you for joining us. But at this time, I think we're going to go ahead and close out. I uh, look forward to hearing about who's won the rice. And everybody take care. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.